morning, everybody, and thank you, Kim, for that uh, very kind uh, introduction. So I don't have to say many words about my person. Most of you I already met yesterday during our very nice excursion, which we had thanks to Sierra at that point again. That was arranged very well and selected very well uh, what we have seen uh, yesterday. Thank you also, Kim, for the summary of my presentation, what's upcoming. Actually, uh, it was perfect and we could um, immediately enter into discussions. Um, <laughs> uh, but uh, still, I might repeat some points and maybe <laughs> go, go more deep, go more deep in, in one uh, or the other one. Um, I know that you know the FSC already, I think, from the beginning of your summer school, you got an introduction, but since uh, not only summer school participants are in the room, uh, please uh, let me introduce the FSC again, very briefly, uh, about 10 to 15 minutes, uh, I think, and uh, then uh, afterwards we will enter the uh, presentation on ICT in agriculture, which, as I said before, uh, very nice uh, was summarized by Kim already. That was the crucial points. Uh, well, I can put it uh, at this moment. Uh, most of you I already uh, mentioned uh, yesterday uh, that I I can do uh, 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 lectures where only one person is speaking, but I don't like this actually. <laughs> I uh, like uh, questions, I like discussions, uh, and please, uh, whenever you feel to have a comment or questions, uh, don't hesitate to interrupt me and just let me know what you want to comment or what the question is and we will try to, to solve it immediately. I would be happy if we could end up with some vital discussions about the challenging topic of ICT and digitalization in agriculture. you agree? So Food Security Center is an excellent center for education, exchange and uh, development. The short uh, abbreviation is XSEED and uh, it's funded by the DAAD and besides the Hohenheim Food Security Center there are four more XSEED centers financed by the DAAD in Germany. I will uh, show you later who that is. Uh, Kim already said, uh, since 2017, I'm the director of this uh, unit in uh, Hohenheim University. Uh, but before, I was joining the board already for uh, seven or eight years, so I know the FSC from the very uh, beginning. Uh, Dr. Maria Cristeta, uh, she's the regional coordinator, and uh, I will come back to this later on as well. Very briefly to the history, it was founded in 2010 as part of the EXE program of the DAAD. So we are about 10 years uh, working uh, within the Food Security uh, Center. Um, the EXE program is supporting institutions that uh, contribute to the realization of sustainable development goals. You all probably know the 17 SDGs but I will show you later on uh, as well. Uh, uh, funding is quite substantial and uh, gives us quite uh, many possibilities to, to uh, work on uh, this issue. In a five years period, we receive up to 5 million euros and uh, PhD scholarships, postdocs, uh, visiting professors and such kind of things, summer schools like we have here, are financed by this uh, budget and uh, are organized by Hohenheim uh, staff and by our regional coordinators. Um, what was the funding? Yeah, it's, it should be and developed to be a, food uh, a, a competence center for food security uh, with quite a substantial outreach. Meanwhile, we did a lot of advertisement and uh, organized a lot of events. One is the World Food Day Colloquium coming up on October 16th. Maria will be there and we do that. You will be there. Yes, uh, yes. You. Right, sorry. Uh, and uh, so uh, that's a meeting point for um, yeah people interested in food security and related related issues. Um, here again the definition what FAO. Um, 
or how FAO defines food security. Uh, food security exists when all people at all time have physical, social, and economic access to sufficient, safe, and nutritious food, which meets their dietary needs and food preferences for an active and healthy life. The key words are availability, access, utilization, and stability of food. It's not an easy task to fulfill, actually. Um, it's uh, quite difficult sometimes. The mission of SS FSC is uh, to provide innovative and effective scientific contributions to achieve uh, uh, food security, which was defined before. Uh, in particular, we are contributing uh, to SDG 1, and, uh, which is no poverty, and SDG 2, which is zero hunger. Um, and further goals which uh, are touched by the outcomes of FSC are number 5, 1 to 5, 12, 13, 15, 17, and here you can see the listing or the overview of the 17 sustainability <coughs> development goals. And if you go through it, you will see that almost each aspect of our life and our societies is touched somehow, at least by one of the uh, goals, uh, even some are uh, touched by, by more than one of the uh, sustainability goals. How do we do that? What are our approaches teaching? What we do here? We have short courses, we have summer schools, two uh, topics. Uh, I should mention maybe at that point that our approach is a so-called demand-driven approach. And that's for what we need our strategic partners in different regions of the world because we have to know what are the issues which should be tackled, what are the most important things which uh, should be stressed by uh, any kind of short course, summer school or talk, special talk or, or visiting professor or what, what, whatever. And that we do in our annual planning meetings and in other occasions when we meet, we collect, we collect topics. Yeah? And afterwards we look for the right persons who could supervise, who could teach, and then we look for candidates for scholarships uh, or whatever. Our thematic focuses are biomass, food availability, food access, food use, food quality, and food safety, gender equality, sustainability of agricultural production, and uh, if you go back to the sustainability development goals, you will find the linkages to quite many of them with what we are trying to do in uh, Hohenheim. So uh, I mentioned before that from these exceed centers, we have five in Germany, uh, all in the ninth year now and uh, close uh, before termination or preliminary termination. Uh, one is dealing with um, sustainable water management, that's uh, the Technical University in Braunschweig, north of Germany. University Kassel is dealing with international, uh, is uh, or running an international center for development and decent work. Um, the Ludwig Maximilian University in Munich, there is the center for international health involved, so medical topics are covered there, and the University of Applied Sciences in Cologne, uh, they deal with natural resources and uh, development. Again, here you see a map with our uh, partners. Um, let's start um, in the far west. This uh, Universidad de Costa Rica uh, is uh, one of our strategic partners, and we have uh, one student at least here who is studying there, and our coordinator is Victor Jimenez. Then we have University of Abu Kalawi in Benin. We have two participants from, yeah, one, uh, I've seen, ah, yeah, I've seen you before. Um, yeah, there's Dr. Afiu, our uh, partner there, then University of Nairobi in uh, Kenya. There are at least two ladies here, yeah, and that's um, um, also our partner. Then we have as an associate partner, uh, Ethiopia, in, in Ethiopia, Havasa University. I will come to back uh, to, to this uh, uh, later um, because that's a special relationship we have uh, here. And then it's Kasetsak University. We have one Thai colleague here. 
that's Dr. Chanwit, our coordinator, ritual coordinator, and of course Siaka, which you know uh, best at the moment. Uh, that's uh, Ria, our regional coordinator, and Siarka uh, uh, is the organization which we are uh, cooperating and collaborating uh, with. Our mm -hmm. okay. Persons. Um, uh, I'm the director of the uh, Food Security Center since 2017, and uh, I come from the Department of Farm Management, so I'm an ag economist. Actually, that's one part of uh, food security, actually, but I'm quite happy to uh, have a vice director from our neighboring faculty. We have in Lohenheim, we have three faculties natural science, agricultural science, and economics. And Jan Frank is from natural science and he's a nutrition uh, specialist. So that's the second and latter part of food security, as you have seen before. So both of us, we um, cover quite a big range of uh, issues uh, tackled. Executive management will be done by Dr. Nicole Schönleber. Then we have an internal advisory board with uh, three colleagues uh, from uh, Hohenheim University, Markus von uh, Animal Nutrition, uh, Michael Alheim from the Economics Faculty, and Julia Fritz-Schreuber from the Natural Science Faculty. And then we have uh, uh, finally an external advisory board with uh, members from different organizations dealing with developing issues and actually they are a good source for us to collect and to receive some ideas and some well political developments and some strategic uh, developments so if it comes to writing proposals they help us a lot to uh, put the focus on the right on the right issues and concerns um, as uh, mentioned before, our main activities are in education, in research, in capacity strengthening, and in knowledge uh, transfer. The last nine uh, years, our outcome, some figures and facts, we had uh, about 65 long-term scholars, uh, PhD candidates, 73 short-term scholars, uh, mainly postdocs, who stay for four months, um, maximum six months in Hohenheim, and working on one or two uh, publications. Uh, that was quite fruitful uh, to my observation. We had six visiting professors staying for a period of one half or one year in Hohenheim, and we um, we're happy to receive funds or to apply for funds uh, 18 times for field research. There are quite a number of associations and uh, organizations and NGOs uh, linked to development issues uh, and um, are quite happy to support something like they, they usually uh, do not provide full scholarships for three years, that's too much for them. They work with smaller budgets, but they, for instance, uh, provide our PhD uh, students with some $5,000 or some 5,000 euros for doing field experiments or something like this. And the scholarship is paid by FSC. Yeah, so it's a combination, but it perfectly fits. Um, that's uh, the number of persons under FSCs in the last uh, nine or ten years. Uh, we have to work on the gender issue. We are not even yet, but uh, still the number is not bad, I would say, we have here. Uh, and that's all exceed centers and uh, compared with uh, these numbers we are doing quite, um, quite well. Um, research. Yeah, research is um, besides education and besides teaching, uh, a quite important issue and uh, there is a selection of uh, projects which were applied for under the food security center there is one uh, project um, called nutrition sect which is uh, a sect which is uh, done in Sierra Leone with uh, partners then development and implementation of insect-based products that will be the topic of uh, this week's uh, 
I learned um, to uh, enhance food and nutritional security in sub Saharan Africa. It's Anton Nutri until 2019. End of 2019, we have the Biomass Web, uh, part of Globe E EMBF project. And we were quite happy to receive another comprehensive project funded by the DAAD. It's a so called Sustainable Development Goal. Uh, graduate school and uh, the one we have uh, one out of seven bits which are established uh, at the moment in Germany uh, such kind of schools uh, ours is the Gleifut climate change and food security um, graduate school which we do in collaboration with the Ethiopian University Havasa University and um, this SDG graduate school do at least once a year a network meeting where all the seven uh, graduate schools meet and that was right last week uh, the University of Rostock, a city in the very north part of Germany uh, and their partners in Hanoi, they organized that meeting and I spent three days in Hanoi to attend this meeting. Last year's meeting was done by us and our Havasa colleagues, so we did it in Havasa, and next year it will be in the Andes, um, in Peru. Uh, there is uh, the uh, Free University of Berlin has partners in Peru, and we will do the meeting there. These are quite fruitful meetings because uh, very different disciplines come together: uh, sociologists and natural science people and musicians and the egg people and the food people and uh, this is very inspiring it was a nice meeting in, in Hanoi so that's this uh, uh, climate change effects on food security in graduate school with uh, Havasa University in Ethiopia here the SDG development goals which are touched by these projects and the main objective of life is the education of African students at post in brackets doctorate uh, level in addressing the threats of climate change to food security in the eastern african region um, we have established uh, six so-called tandem uh, projects uh, they have two supervisors one from hawassa one from hohenheim uh, which fit disciplinary very good together and two phd candidates but all the phd candidates come from africa yeah uh, and they have two supervisors and uh, two weeks from now uh, they meet for their um, uh, second yearly blog seminar they have to report or well, they give status reports about their work and for us it's the chance to have uh, discussions network uh, networking with uh, uh, the other um, uh, colleagues from from Havasa University so just at a glance, uh, overall thematic focus is climate change and food security, uh, tight connection between education and research, we try to cover both. Graduate school is located at Havasa University, we have 10, 12 long-term PhD uh, scholars and two postdocs and two coordinators. Uh, this uh, research is done interdisciplinarily with a special reference to the Agenda 2030 and its SDGs, as mentioned before. And there's a joint uh, developed qualification program with a strong ICT-based uh, component. Um, ICT-based component, uh, which will be the topic afterwards, uh, important on one hand, difficult on the other hand. We used the Hanoi meeting for also doing a workshop, a workshop between uh, all the graduate schools and they gave us three topics. One of the topics was using ICT in education, uh, remote, uh, remote um, uh, education, distance teaching and so on. And the outcomes were, uh, yeah, to, to very briefly summarize it, it's urgently needed because there are long distances to overcome and that would help actually but there are obstacles and impediments as well on the other side quite simple sometimes we are running out of electric power in our sun 
or we do not have internet connection. And uh, basic things are just uh, missing and hindering. And we find we have to find some compromise solutions, yeah, blended learning, how it's called, uh, to have uh, on site visits and face-to-face um, -face, um, lectures um, mixed and merged with uh, distance teaching things. This time I cannot be in Havasa due to other obligations and we will try, since we have a sub-project sub leaders meeting, uh, to link with via uh, uh, television or via, via some, some other technology uh, to the meeting at least for 20 minutes to say hello to everybody and to introduce myself and excuse myself. Uh, yeah, and capacity building of course. Um, no, I can step back for a moment, I think. And we have this um, short uh, image video from Food Spirit Center, and later on we will start with our lesson. Plenty of nutritious, diverse, and healthy food throughout the whole year. But not everybody is as fortunate as we are. German SDG graduate school, Climate Change Effects on Food Security, short name is CLIFU. Another interdisciplinary research project is dealing with edible insects, and what we investigate is how this foodstuff can contribute to increasing food security on one hand and rural incomes on the other hand. Our goal is to reduce hunger and to achieve food security. Every small success towards this goal counts.
Okay, uh, uh, I hope you got an idea what we are doing with the FSC and uh, we will have a budget until the end of this year. Then we hope that we get a phasing out period, all the five FSC centers will be closed and will be replaced by new ones. Uh, the structure we don't know yet, Hohenheim handed in a proposal for the new period, uh, but we will see there were 35 applications I was told uh, in, in Hanoi and uh, probably five or four will be will be um, will be approved uh, later on but uh, yeah we will have to know as soon as we get some news about the phasing out it was promised to us within the next three weeks we get an answer that would give us at least three years of this low budget a chance to to continue with what we have uh, started but uh, we will we will see any other comments or uh, questions at that point? I know it was a repetition for some of you, uh, but anyway, uh, we uh, like to uh, that you keep the FSC and its work uh, very good in your in your memory. Okay, then we start with our second or with the uh, mean. The main uh, contribution, I'm not sure it was, uh, it's the very ending actually, sorry. <laughs> yeah. And here I'm going to start with a short reminder. When you look at the faces, I think, Maria, we had fun. <laughs> it was a nice day. Thanks a lot to Sierra for organizing this one. And uh, yeah, we experienced new things, uh, eating with uh, wet feet. <laughs> uh, but it was nice, finally, it cooled you down a little bit. Uh, and we had a relaxing, relaxing day. And I, as I can see, everybody went home well and uh, had a good rest, so we are ready for the third week of uh, your summer school. Um, the topic we are dealing uh, with, or I'm dealing with, uh, or we will discuss about, is information and communication technologies in agriculture and agribusiness. Um, I want to have a short view back, uh, since it's a technology, with an interesting history, actually, the basics, they, they very, the very, uh, yeah, uh, basics date back uh, seven, several centuries, but uh, the rapid development is quite a young story, actually. Yeah? I remember the time, uh, I, my, my PhD thesis was not written on a computer. Not written on a PC. Well, I'm 33 years now, uh, but that was 40 years ago. But that's not a long period, actually. Yeah? All my successors started to do that via PC, so it was in the 19, beginning of 1980s. There was no personal computer yet. Yeah? You have to imagine, no networks, internet, we even didn't know the name or couldn't spell the name of such kind of things. So that was a quite rapid development, and uh, I wanted to show you, show you some, some milestones which, which, which were uh, in between. Um, why is the topic important? Um, you all might know, um, uh, sometimes politicians and um, also scientific uh, people talk about megatrends. And uh, megatrends are developments which we observe which cannot be influenced by single persons or by single countries or by single units somehow. They come anyway. Yeah, they have their own way and you have two options. You can refuse it, then you are out of business in latest five years, or you can uh, link to it somehow and take it over in your own business. And uh, that's the approach uh, which is recommendable, of course. You might like it or might, might like it not, but uh, it will come anyway. And if you want to be part of a social community, part of a business community, part of a branch, part of a market, do some marketing work with partners in the food supply chain or in the supply chain somehow, 
then you have to adjust to it and you have to adjust to certain rules. And that makes it so important to talk about this one. Uh, technology is, um, technology is uh, advanced, I would say. People applying this uh, 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 technology are far back, actually, in experience, in education, and that will be in future the major issue, and that makes also such kind of uh, presentations important to exchange, and that's the reason why I want to have discussions afterwards, to exchange experiences and new ideas and developments which are going on in your countries, compared to Europe, compared to the US, and uh, uh, find out solutions which are appropriate to certain structures, to certain farming structures. That's what we have to discuss about, and that's the idea behind my presentation. The outline will be as uh, follows. Uh, again, I will, you, I will uh, the mega trend uh, issue I already mentioned, but I will, you, will uh, show you some uh, reasons and some uh, developments um, which make it necessary to deal with uh, this subject. Then, uh, short view back. Then state of the art and uh, the major part of the presentation will be what perspectives we have and what consequences this have, uh, has for farmers, particularly or for those applying this kind of technology. And they are quite substantial, yeah? they are disruptive. That's not smoothly anything, but there are really disruptive developments uh, going on when we really move to, to ICT. Uh, let's start uh, with um, the general challenges for agriculture. They are well known by you, but I will summarize again. The first, and for me the foremost, is uh, food and nutrition. And Kim already mentioned before that the world population still is increasing. And we will um, exceed the 9 billion, I think, very soon. And there are countries uh, among us, like uh, China, with still high rates, and Africa with still high rates of population uh, increase. And that will last uh, for the next decades, I'm very sure. And uh, we have limited resources for food production on the other hand. So the only thing we can do is we can improve or increase the productivity of these limited resources and get more output per unit. Yeah? and digitalization is something which could assist. Uh, biomass is a challenge for us because sometimes it gets into competition with food production, yeah, biomass from arable land, uh, biogas or whatever is used uh, always is in competition with food. The more biomass I produce, the less food area I have. Then uh, resource management for me, uh, well, they are all important, but a very important issue. And I could imagine that water, water resources will become uh, a crucial point in the future um, and will divide the world into at least two different regions uh, with more or less uh, access to water resources. Climate uh, and agriculture has at least two relations. Uh, agriculture is one source of climate change, or time, is uh, one important guess. And on the other hand, and that might be the more important one, we receive climate change and we have to adjust to climate change somehow. And the uh, bad story about this, uh, regions in the world who already suffer most at the moment will most suffer by climate change. And those who are quite well off at the moment, they will have benefits from the climate change because the range of products they can produce will be uh, broader. That makes it not easier. Uh, on the other hand, there is biodiversity, a big issue, shrinking, shrinking all over the world and we are losing species uh, which we uh, should not want to, uh, to get uh, uh, lost. Uh, so, uh, agriculture also contributes due to cultural landscapes and um, uh, biotopes and um, other issues that we keep up with a certain level of uh, biodiversity. Cultural landscapes, uh, we have seen several yesterday on our drive, it's uh, dominated by rice production in uh, Philippines and in Southeast Asia in general, 
It's dominated by a mixture of grassland, arable land, and forest in Europe and in Northern America. And uh, agriculture is a big contributor to uh, produce or to let us have uh, diverse uh, cultural uh, landscapes and we keep on uh, going. Competitiveness, from the economic perspective, the markets are more and more global and if we want to have success on these global markets, we have to have competitive agriculture. That means, uh, not besides biodiversity, besides cultural landscapes and besides these societal uh, demands we have, we still have to, to be well off to compete on uh, the international markets. You are on the export markets for rice, we are in Germany on the export markets for dairy products and for pork and uh, such kind of products. We have to remain uh, competitive. And uh, last, but not, last but not least, um, rural areas. Uh, probably all of us face the development of urbanization. Who comes from a country where urbanization is not an issue? It's not an issue. We come from? US. Huh? US. US, yes, you are right. Yeah, you are right. <laughs> Uh, but all others uh, observe uh, that, that kind of development, uh, particularly young people, young families uh, move to the cities and uh, they generally uh, re remain back in the, in the countryside and um, rural areas are uh, increasingly lacking uh, from infrastructure which is needed to uh, have, a, have a, good, a good living in this, uh, in this um, area. Okay. To summarize it, uh, the challenges are food security, food safety, resource conservation and satisfaction of social demands. And uh, we are, well that's our hypothesis actually, uh, that um, we have to use all kinds of optimization potential and uh, in future and nowadays that only can be done when integrating of information and communication technologies into our uh, development in our technical progress in technology development of, sorry, of the uh, future. Uh, this has um, implications uh, from I IT to the um, branch to the sector of agriculture. We will have and already have growing demands for data diversity and quality. Uh, that means we need an efficient information management through innovative services and products. And we have to um, further integrate um, food supply chains or agro-food supply chains and regional clusters of production by means of digital communication media. What are the obstacles? What are the, the uh, impediments we have uh, there? Um, there is um, extended small business structure in the primary production sector in most of the countries, besides US, they are quite strong, the single farm uh, businesses, but in uh, most of the other countries we have small farmers with low power on the food chain and they are the dominating and uh, large and powerful uh, uh, food retail stores, but that's the same in the US actually, and they dominate and they influence the agri-food supply chains uh, very much. We have an increase in multifunctionality of agriculture. The challenges have shown on which uh, places we have to contribute. Uh, the operational structural asymmetries I already mentioned, the dominating food retailers with lots of power and small farmers on the other side. Uh, they have to negotiate about prices and quality and changes in organization and governance. We observe isolated software applications still in some areas. So there's produced software for a single branch or for a single process, but it's not interlinked to other um, um, IT and digital devices. That has to be solved somehow. And we have a unity broadband connection and uh, limited um, uh, uh, smartphone connections uh, in the rural areas still. Uh, I don't know about the situation in the Philippines, but in Germany we have actually. When you go 50 kilometers out of Stuttgart, it's, um, yeah, 
very gumpy, very um, uh, limited what, what you have as um, connections. So what lies behind, as I already have said it uh, before, the very basis, like the calculating clock by Schickard was done uh, or developed uh, or investigated in the 17th uh, century already, punch cards for weaving, uh, 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 weaving um, are developed by Schackard in the 19th uh, century and the telephone by Alexander Graham Bell um, in uh, the late uh, 19th uh, century. This was um, yeah, the, some basic elements which we still have in ICT development today. The younger history starts in the middle of the 20th century. The first uh, freely programmable computer was uh, developed by Konrad Zuse and by uh, Eiken and the von Neumann structure is still the basic structure of computers uh, nowadays. 1958, the modem uh, was developed by engineers from Bell Telephone Laboratories. The first network, ARPANET, for military purposes was developed in 1969, 16-bit processors in 1978, application programs, and that was when I was writing my master thesis, uh, so I was uh, not in the lucky position to use a computer, I had to do it by, a, I don't know what they are, were called, these uh, typing machines, uh, yeah, typewriters, typewriters, um, typewriters are good, on one hand, but when you make a mistake on one page, you have to write a page again. Uh, and that yeah, makes you know, can make things difficult. Then the first um, internet forum was in uh, the 1990s, and the World Wide Web was uh, developed, developed or invented by Tim Berners Lee, um, end of uh, last century, and uh, that's only a selection of what happened since uh, 2000, uh, UMTS, New Economy, Web 2.0, 3.0, Agriculture uh, 4.0, and many, 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 many other uh, developments in digital technologies. Um, there was a staff member of IBM in uh, earlier years, and uh, he, his name was Moore, and uh, uh, after they named a, a, a law after him, that Mo that's Moore's law. Uh, he made the observation that every 18 to 24 months, the complexity of integrated circuits uh, doubles. Uh, and there you see the development until 2000 that has been keeping on and, uh, to my observation, even increasing the time periods become shorter. So technology is developing rapidly, and I would say from the hardware side, the limitations are low. Yeah. From hardware we will manage uh, most of things upcoming. Uh, the crucial points are more the data analysis and of course the data interpretation and the data and, and, and having conclusions out of this uh, uh, data um, collection. So in the younger history, as you can see, uh, concerning um, or imagine a farm, uh, there was also documentation of data about different fields, about different animals we had, but until the 1975, the middle of 1980, uh, uh, 1970, uh, uh, it was uh, written down in a notebook in a chronological way. Yeah? What we have seen during the day, chronologically you would uh, write down, uh, and that's okay, yeah, you would, you would find it again, but when it comes to analysis of a certain field or of a certain uh, dairy cow herd or of a certain branch of the farm, you have collect numbers from different pages, yeah, the chronological thing is not good anymore. Uh, that was a big progress uh, to do it systematically, and we used cards, cards for each field or cards for each cow or cards for each uh, other issue machinery and we summarized uh, all the information about that specific field on one card. It was actually the basic of electronic and computerized plot record systems. They work after this idea, actually. 
And when it comes to analysis there, you only have to take out one card and you got all the uh, information comprehensively on that one card. And uh, if you have worked with plot record systems on a, a digital basis, you still have these cards. Yeah? One is for plant uh, breeding, one is for uh, seeding, one is for harvest, uh, one, one uh, part of this uh, card. And you have all the numbers for wheat production or for maize production or for anything else uh, summarized on one card. Um, and then in the 1990s uh, uh, there were development many, 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 many uh, software solutions for each specific task, a single one. The only thing they were lacking is they were interlinked. Yeah? You have to take the data from one software and you have to manually input it into another software. So the major task we are still working on today is integration. And integration means that we have a common that we have to have a common language that everybody understands or every software understands the same. Yeah? If we are talking about a tractor, a tractor with a certain horsepower uh, limit, then the US, the Honduras people, the uh, people from all over the world have to understand. Yeah? That's the same machinery. And that's not easy, actually. Yeah? Because they are categorized differently in different countries, but uh, the software cannot make a distinction. Tractor is tractor. And there has to be an agreement yeah, that everybody talks about the same. We'll come to that later on. Uh, nowadays we are talking a lot about precision farming and uh, we think that precision farming is something innovative and something new. It is not, as you can see on this picture. That is also kind of precision farming. Uh, maybe now I can draw a question. What's precision in this uh, picture? Or what's the basic idea of, uh, of uh, precision farming? You have a big plot, 20 hectares in the US, it would be 80 hectares. Uh, in other countries, it would be smaller. And what is precision farming doing? Or what is one of the ideas of precision farming? This, this large field, the 80 hectare field, is not homogeneous. Usually, it's not homogeneous. Yeah? Different soils, different water uh, storage capacity, and uh, different nutrient capacities, and so on. Uh, and when you treat it average, on average, uh, you oversupply some parts and you uh, undersupply other parts. So what's the idea of precision farming? It's just a way of farming. It's knowing your environment, as you said before, yeah. and uh, doing it particular management in each yes. area. Subdivide of large units, which are heterogeneous, virtually. Yeah? By GPS we know where we are and at what time we are at that point and then we can adjust if we have information about the, uh, the soil or about uh, other issues we can adjust our treatment uh, to, to, this, uh, to this certain plot and we can make these plots as small as we want generally. Yeah? It doesn't economically make much sense but, but uh, technology allows uh, to, to do that. And now look at this lady. And, and uh, actually, the, the application and the observations are done by, by sensors in modern precision agriculture. Sensors are the eyes, yes, and adjustment of treatment is done manually, yeah, on this hole, yeah. So um, the only problem is um, uh, this lady in the probably 1950s or 1940s, they had half a hectare or one hectare of land and five different crops. If you take her and her children and grandchildren, they can manage. But what happened during the time? We had at least, well, we had many developments, but we had at least two relevant developments. We had structural change in farming. Farms grew and became bigger, so the lady was overloaded with doing that in a reasonable time period and we had technology development uh, to replace the eyes by lenses and sensors and to replace 
the location finding by GPS and other devices. And uh, then we have machinery like uh, spreaders or uh, others which are adjustable uh, uh, to new information which we have. So that's what we have today, a multi-layer picture of the field and uh, lots of uh, information going on. We'll come to that later on. I will explain that to you on, on, ah, here it is, yes. <laughs> on, another, on another picture in, in, in more detail. So where are we now? Uh, where are we standing at the, the moment with our development? Um, yeah, uh, let's um, develop um, the organizational structure in most agricultural sectors. First of all, we all deal with processes. Processes are seeding, processes are fertilizer spraying, plant protection spraying, or uh, feeding in the stable, or uh, such kind of thing are processes. Yeah. Uh, they are closed circles mostly. There is a need. The need will be fulfilled by providing something and then uh, something will be produced, the fertilizer will be removed and so on. Uh, and these processes have to be optimized. Processes are usually summarized to branches. That's arable land production, that's livestock production, that's sugar beet production or maize production or something. And several branches usually are combined in a farm enterprise. Yeah. And uh, we have to keep that in mind because each and every level we have to optimize using digital solutions later on. But the farmers are not alone standing anymore. They are members of a food supply chain, agro-food supply chain, existing of suppliers where they receive their feed from, their fertilizer from, their machinery from, then the primary production, then they they don't go directly to the market. There are processors, there are traders, there are retail stores, and there are com computers, uh, com uh, uh, consumers at the end. Why am I showing you this picture? Um, if you have a misfunction in one step, even in one early step of such kind of uh, food supply chains, let's uh, say you receive rotten feed from a company then you never will, uh, you never will uh, be able to produce high, con high quality at the very end of the supply chain. So what has to happen? They have to talk to each other or to communicate with each other. They have to follow the same quality standards. They have to be open for traceability issues. Yeah? If something is uh, observed at the very end, I very quickly have to find the reasons uh, where it happened to uh, stop these uh, malfunctions in the food supply chain. And we come later on to this point again, uh, digitalization can help a lot. And uh, last but not least, if uh, uh, there are stage spanning, integrating key factors, and I mentioned quality already, but also logistics has to fit to each other. Even the uh, uh, connectivity of data has to fit, technologies have to fit, and uh, they sometimes uh, are in different regulatory frameworks, uh, different laws are applied at different stages of the supply chain, and they have also become integrated. Uh, concerning uh, software solutions, we are well off, I would say. You again have the processes, the branches, the enterprise, the um, interspatial and temporal uh, extension and the sectors. And as you can see on the right side, for each and every step of the food supply chain, we have software products and we have uh, information processing uh, products and uh, devices which we can use. The crucial question, as said before, is uh, it's okay. Um, yeah, the, the crucial point is um, the, the thing of integration of these different levels and these uh, different software products we have there. 
Now let's um, have a look on it on, uh, from another perspective, the development stages, uh, and I do it uh, twice. I do it once for uh, crop production with um, machinery, in that case a tractor, and I do it later on for livestock production as well. Uh, the development stages, uh, they were developed and quite often used uh, from Porter and Heppelmann in 2014. Um, 20 years ago, 25 or 30 years ago, we were at this step uh, that we had uh, products, yeah, like a single unit of tractor, which was not linked to everything, to, to anything. It was just a machine which assisted labor work or replaced uh, uh, manual labor work uh, from uh, farming. Those tractors became intelligent uh, products. Different um, parts of the tractor were linked to each other by electronic devices. Uh, then the next step was intelligent integrated product uh, tractors via um, the remote uh, control became connected to other machinery, even to farm offices. They could report their data they collected or to fertilizer spreaders or to other machinery. And then we uh, developed further to intelligent product uh, systems. Uh, that means that a whole unit uh, consisting of tractor, uh, harvesting unit or fertilizer spreading unit or tractor and um, truck which supplies some new fertilizer to them, they are interlinked and integrated in one software. And the solution we are working on is the system of systems. Uh, same uh, or similar development in animal production. First there was the animal and there was manual devices and manual tools to get the milk out of the cow. Uh, then technology came, stupid technology at the very beginning, only removing the milk out of the cow. Yeah, with this machinery. No data collection, no temperature uh, sensors or no other quality uh, sensors which could be used. That was in the next step, third step, and then this became integrated. That means the milking parlor, the milking robot, can communicate directly with the feeding machine. And if milk, daily milk production per cow reduces slowly, he will give some information to the feeding machine and the feeding machine will adjust the concentration of the feed or the amount of the feed or both. Yeah? So the system is always um, on, a, on, a correct, um, on a correct level. And um, also here, uh, so uh, systems talk to each other and uh, the final solution will be the system of the systems that uh, Different systems like dairy cow production or milk production and fodder production, feed production become interlinked, these branches, under the umbrella of a whole enterprise. And later on, you can even proceed uh, to whole agro food uh, supply chains to uh, develop this. So, what awaits us in the future? So if you want to talk about the future, um, one approach uh, would be. Uh, to find out what are the drivers and what are the obstacles of the development of a technology. Yeah, you know, what circumstances could, could be in favor of to have more digital technology and what can be hindering factors uh, to do that. And I summarized, um, that's not complete, yeah? I don't uh, want to see that complete, but these are major and important factors who will influence the future development. I have already mentioned that we are talking about a mega trend development, which hardly can be influenced by individuals. Uh, it is uh, just something which will be there and we have to adjust to, to uh, do that or to, to accept this and to integrate it into our production processes. Um, one important thing will be economic and market factors. We have to optimize uh, our production processes to remain to be competitive for the world market because our competitors on the market do it as well. And if we uh, won't do it, we will not be competitive anymore in a few years. 
uh, uh, farm efficient uh, management. Uh, I have shown uh, you have to break down the farm into different levels, processes, branches, uh, whole farm, then uh, agro food supply chain issues, yeah, and common common things we have to follow. Inter-enterprise information systems, also farms in the same regions uh, often we uh, build, build uh, clusters and if it's let's say dairy cow farms there's also a veterinarian involved and a feed speci specialist involved and somebody from uh, slaughterhouse maybe is involved and from the dairy company, processing company is involved and they build regional clusters yeah, to exchange information which should be collected only once, each single data only once. Electronic business is also in agriculture a, a, a big issue. Meanwhile, and we will come later on, we are working or are close to the step of real-time enterprises. No stocks or only limited number of stocks anymore. Everything will be ordered and delivered on time. Yeah? No storage in between. Yeah? Only on trucks and directly to the final destination. Then uh, supply chains um, can be complex and uh, we have asymmetric power and asymmetric information distribution along these supply chains and quality assurance and traceability are big issues. The demand for this comes from the consumer side. Consumers and their association, they want to know where the feed, uh, their uh, food in the shelf, in the in the supermarket comes from and how is it treated and uh, that's actually a big discussion in Germany and in Europe in the moment and we maybe could use that for getting some comments how the situation is in, in your country. I briefly uh, explain what, what happens in Germany. Agriculture in general is under observation of the society and they find quite a number of things which they don't agree with, like herbicide, pesticides and so on, and uh, large-scale agriculture, industrial agriculture they call it, yeah, industrial, and particular livestock production is under observation, very critically under observation, and they're also the industrial ones, yeah, it's the 100,000 chicks or the 100,000 pigs in their uh, industrial uh, production facilities. They are under discussion and we have to work and uh, it's uh, not easy to fulfill tasks actually. We have to work on that and our farmers associations already develop strategies to um, yeah, provide information, information which is more realistic. Uh, on the other hand, there, there, uh, we have the situation that the society uh, does barely have a chance to get insight into agriculture. Agriculture is in the remote areas, uh, on farms, and society is more urbanized. Meanwhile, and I think little school children or kindergarten children, they barely don't know anything about what a cow looks like and where the milk comes from. There was a, actually a, a story, uh, well, it's a German brand of chocolate, it's Milka chocolate. You know Milka chocolate? Yes. It's a violet, it's a violet package, yes. yeah. And they, they did a survey in a kindergarten or in a primary school or something, and uh, people were making their crosses that uh, the color of milk is lila, is uh, is uh, purple. <laughs> and cows also are purple, of course. Uh, otherwise, you could not produce that kind of chocolate. Yeah. And <clears throat> such things, uh, misunderstandings, and. Uh, that cannot be the basis for a serious discussion, actually. We have to know each other, so agriculture has to open, have to make open their days for the society and uh, show them and tell them the reason why they're producing like they do, otherwise they would be out of business and not competitive anymore. Uh, that has to be understood by both sides, consumers and, uh, consumers and uh, the producers on the, on the other side. Um, yeah, that's about the situation in Germany, Europe, and now I would be interested in uh, yeah, how's in your country. I actually have a question for you. Um, my mind was scattered on this, so I'm hoping you clarify this for me. Are you aware of ISO? ISO, International Standards? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they have a grant for a certain uh, training for 22,000. 
that falls in line with the quality insurance interest. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Because I'm the impression that most of the European countries, some of the Asian countries, but they, they're actually trying to get under this standard. Yeah. So That's right. as they're doing this, some countries are not being able to adhere to it because of uh, funds. Yeah. Now, from my understanding, again, come back to your education on this one. The FSC works in tandem with them. Yeah. So what do you guys do to help some of these countries actually keep up the speed, to keep up the standards? Would be a nice topic for a thesis. <laughs> <laughs> yet in many, many other countries, including Europe. We are not at that stage yet, so you can be happy to, to have this, um, this potential to, to do that. Uh, but we have to work uh, on reaching this uh, target. And we are on the way, I think. And we are also on the way to maybe find a solution which are a little bit uh, lower in cost, but not less in efficient, like the system you are working on. But that's a very, very crucial issue. Yeah. And digitalization can help, of course. Yep. Uh, just to go further with that, uh, so I, I, I lived quite a long, uh, many years in group, and one thing that really made a lot of the industry uh, change throughout the standards and interna internationalization was that um, was the free trade agreements. So the free trade agreements might have very bad things for some people, but at the same time, they push for standards. So if they want to go to Europe, if they want to continue to um, the USA or to the Asian countries, they have to meet these standards, otherwise they will never be able to export. So yes, there might be some crucial bad things about free trade for some people, but at the same time, they have made the industry much more competitive, much more clean. Uh, there are safeguards for both the consumers and the exporters and the importers. So it's a way of pushing standards in a uh, global framework. Because when say, the, the policy has been developed in countries that they want to have that same policy as the States or, or, or Europe, then that same policy starts applying in the new countries that are trying to become part of the global economy. Uh, and, and a second thing is an initiative called GoDan. There's a uh, global open data for agriculture and nutrition. And they're uh, doing open data. They, they not just want uh, <coughs> standards and they start to push for ISO, but they want all the data that is produced from the, from the little robots to the actual consumers to be open, to be able to increase traceability and security, 
and at the same time to create new services. Um, uh, that they want to do it in blockchain, but in order to increase the, the, the privacy. But there are at least two initiatives that I know, one being free trade, or the agreements, and this other thing called GoDAP, G-O-D-A-N. I have a question. All the farmers can reach to programs, for example, the, the small folders and things like that, or only the, the big farmers? So in, in, at least in Peru, again, uh, Ecuador has not uh, pushed so much into freight trade as Peru has done in the last 20 years. And uh, once the cooperative of a small farmer wants to export it, they have to be vetoed in order to make that happen. So if they want to export, if they don't want to export, there's no traceability. Just directly. Directly to your question, that's a very, very important point when it comes to implementation of digitalization. If you have a wide range of different farm sizes, yes. uh, always the big ones are better off in applying it, yes. and we have to find the, the, the major parts to find to find solutions for the small, small models, small ones. And actually, we just um, handed in a report for the for the German government or parliament. Uh, on digitalization and the impacts of this uh, digitalization. And one crucial point was that we have to look on the smallholder farmers and uh, solutions would be cooperation and uh, cooperatives actually or we have these machinery reorganizations in Germany yeah, where you, uh, if, you, if you cannot fully use a certain machine you offer it to other farmers and the same can be done with uh, digital technologies of course. Yes, solutions like this, yeah, solutions like this have to be established. Yeah. And a further example, just to um, so <coughs> there's this boutique type of crops in Latin America, or very, you know, very, uh, very nice coffee, or very quinoa that comes from some place, and they are very small uh, farms. But again, so if they want to go for the boutique price in Helsinki, they need to uh, fulfill those requirements. Sometimes they don't. Uh, work by themselves, but they actually try to get the certification from some other company that is part of the food supply chain in order for, for the product to, from a very small farmer, to go to Europe. So, again, uh, people might not be so much into free trade, but there are very few things about <coughs> those things. So, again, okay, back to the fact of cost. Yeah, maybe one more question or comment and then we continue, I just learned, or two, and then I just learned that we have a limited of time, so, and I have a further slide, but we do, you and you. Like, for instance, uh, Wurzburg and Gießen, they have a big, Wurzburg uh, uh, yeah. and Gießen, they yeah. have uh, wine, they have a wine, uh, a yeah. heavy wine uh, yeah. farm area. Yeah. And I think it was during 2007 to 2009 that the government assisted them because as the global trade was actually happening, they provided some type of uh, uh, assistance for them to compete. Because the main thing was finding the funds needed for some of these smaller farms. Because the big yeah. farms will work fine. As a matter of fact, there's a few American companies in Peru that are, produ that are giving production. And what's hurting the economy there is that the smaller farmers can't produce for their local market. So I was curious on what they were doing to try to negate that, or at least keep it competitive. Because that's also happened in uh, Ethiopia, Ethiopia, uh, 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 Niger, and uh, Djibouti. Well, Djibouti doesn't have much of a farming area, but they're trying to, but they're uh, doing more import from other uh, outside of countries. Mm -hmm. so, Again, factor of cost. Like, yeah. what do, do the FC yeah. provide any assistance or any programs towards that? Are you aware of any UN programs? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, the only thing we can do is actually we can we can uh, provide our um, our findings, our um, our um, outcomes from our research, what we do, and from our postdocs and our uh, PhD scholarships. Um, we can work on it if we, that was the reason why I was saying that it would be an interesting topic for a master thesis, but we are not involved in any political decisions, in any uh, administrative processes, uh, that's not our task. 
Yeah? We prepare, we prepare young people, we educate, we make them sensitive for hopefully the right issues which they need. And once they come into positions later on, which have influence on policy and influence on administration, then we have reached our goal. But not FSC directly. Yes, that's not our task. It's teaching research and capacity building, as I said before, and strengthening of networks. Uh, yeah. I'd like to share the Kenyan experience, which I think has been fairly successful. And it is, uh, was my area of work after I'm an undergraduate. And for Kenya, export of uh, fresh vegetables is an important industry. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the producers are small owner farmers. Mm -hmm. And as earlier mentioned, to, uh, to access markets in Europe, which is our uh, big market, you need to attain and comply to the standards. Mm -hmm. and among the many modules, one of the critical ones is traceability. Mm -hmm. So in Kenya, and there are a lot of publications which you can find, and there was, you can find concerning cost, concerning impact on food security. What I mean is that you can find publications on impact of standards on food security, on farmer incomes, there are a lot of them from Kenya, studies mm -hmm. done in Kenya because it has it has been very successful. So, and yes, smallholders are able to attain it because what I worked in after uh, my undergraduate. So I appreciate when you say yes, FSC by training, when you finally, when I am able finally to go join the industry, it is a good investment mm -hmm. because had I not studied uh, agriculture and then when I mm -hmm. went out, I would not have understood mm -hmm. the, mm -hmm. the things. Yeah. So what basically addressability looks like for smallholders is we are supposed, all of us are in a group, you're assigned a specific ID and then your farm has to have a farm map and you have divided it. Um, it's not exactly the level of precision agriculture, your farm division that you have some way of dividing it. Then uh, we, we, we know the new plant, we know because this this, this group would have an office. So the office has a, um, whoever is uh, employed by us. One would be employed, and so that person is able to keep records of, of, for all of us. So we know your specific ID, we know your farm map, we have files, for each one of us files are in the office. So your farm is divided into blocks, so when you get seeds which you receive from the office of this group, you know the seed lot that you planted. You do not buy your own inputs. You go to the office and then you know you you planted block so and so, this was the crop uh, area, and the farm has the office has two people, a technical assistant and a field person. So the field person visits all of us and is able to see your Plot number A, which you planted in week, week uh, we, 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 we give the weeks as per week of the year. So I know plot A, week 52, you have planted an area of 0.25 hectares, no, 2.25 acres, and you know the seed number we planted, and for every input you get, you get it from the office. If you get it from a another supplier, you violated our rules, so you'll be penalized. So we know what inputs you planted, we know where you planted, we know the inputs you used, and when you harvest, you have to, the, the crop has the ID based on your number, your land number, your, your plot number, your week of planting. So yeah, that's the first part of traceability. It is uh, fairly good because we have an office and now the technical assistant is a member of this community. So there is employment, I would say, standards may appear initially to be punitive and to be almost driven by the consumers, but it allows traceability but also transparency. And unfortunately, and this would be my question, uh, which has been a difficult part, to digitize it, because all these details that I'm saying are 
manually inputted. Yes, so the digitization part has thank, been the Thank you for this point. Uh, we will come to that uh, when I give you the idea of this um, outcome of this uh, project we had. Uh, we have to move on with uh, slides because I have some more. Uh, and, uh, but anyway, if you have comments, uh, uh, then, then uh, report to it. We stopped at uh, drivers for the future development of, uh, of uh, digitalization. There's of course technology development and I don't want to repeat the words which are here. I just want to tell you my impression. From uh, different conferences, different meetings I have been where scientists, practitioners like farmers, farmers associations and industry, farm, uh, farm machinery industry and digitalization industry was. And I always leave these uh, meetings with the impression that the engineers on the technology side, in the machinery companies and the IT companies, they do their development and job anyway. They do not ask about the need or barely ask about what is needed, what is urgently needed. They see a challenge and they develop technology. Yeah? Whether it's applied later on or not. So they, they go their way. Yeah? And the question is now, agriculture can either take it over, or partly take it over, or even adjust it how they need it, or refuse it. Yeah? So that's a um, point where we should more have round tables that we, we know from each other in the earlier stage, where the priorities of development have to be set. <clears throat> but so far, I don't know, uh, US situation, I think it's similar. Uh, John Deere and uh, the big companies, they are going their way and either politicians follow or, uh, yeah. Right. Yeah, and they forget a little bit to uh, involve their customers in the development strategies and development processes. So, let's take, so that, that goes its way, yeah, and we have to see what's uh, good for us. Also, environmental and sustainability issues are something which will require more data in the future. I mentioned biodiversity and other uh, sustainable uh, factors and other environmental impacts or environmental issues in agriculture. They become more and more monitored, also by digital systems, and that will also be something driving us, uh, driving us. Even control of such policy measures needs a lot of digitalization. And last but not least, um, social aspects. Uh, I don't have to mention social uh, media. Uh, they go their way. And um, we as um, a branch, as a sector, only can adjust to it. Um, uh, I, I never, uh, or I, I learned a lot, let's say that, that way, in recent years about the potential of uh, uh, social media. And meanwhile, universities and FSC are on Facebook, have to be on Facebook, of course, otherwise they would not be recognized anymore by the younger generation. That's also a big shift, a big movement, which we have to consider when we do some information spreading, some communication, that we meet the right channels to, read, uh, to, to reach the right uh, generation of uh, our future colleagues and our future uh, successors. We start with the uh, economic and market factors, optimization, and this is the picture where I wanted to explain you a little bit, uh, or is it necessary to explain precision agriculture, the basics, how it works. Maybe I do it very briefly in, 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 in some, some works. Uh, some, some works. You see a field here, you see different machinery here, you see satellites here, and you see some different equipment uh, linked to these tractors, to this machine. And the basic thing, uh, as I said before, there's a, a huge field with uh, heterogeneous conditions um, in uh, many respects maybe. Uh, due to water, nutrient and uh, yield capacity or whatever varies over the field and uh, that should be optimized. So we need basically two things. Uh, we need um, um, to uh, identify where we are and, and what time we are at that point. 
That will be done by GPS systems. We have the connection to three or even better four satellites and we can exactly point out where we are at what time we are there. That's the most important information we need. And when we have this information, we can link various and a broad spectrum of data to that information we have. Yeah? That can be soil conditions, that can be uh, nutrient supply in soil, water content in soil, that can be yield which we harvest from this specific plot, that every ca everything can be done. And um, then it becomes collected in these machineries and then we have two ways to deal with this data. We either can store them, we can keep them for next um, vegetation period and use them there. That means we need a database uh, for these uh, data. Or the second approach, uh, the objectives of this is uh, uh, to optimize production, to assess uh, vari variability, uh, to do some site-specific management, less fertilizer here, more here, to get the potential of yield out of each plot and conservation of resources and land and environment, uh, the idea is to actually lower the amount of fertilizer, lower the um, mind of spreading, uh, amount of spreading material and saving cost and not, um, uh, not um, 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 violating the, the um, environmental um, issues in the, in the field. Or the other way would be the so-called real-time approach which um, to me seems to be in favor a little bit of, of uh, farmers because they don't like databases and to link data. Everything is done at the same time. Yeah? Data collection, uh, the example is the spreading of nitrogen fertilizer in uh, wheat or in something like this. And uh, we have some observations here in front that's a, um, a sensor who measures the color, the green color of the wheat in front of the tractor. And the green color in the wheat, uh, if it's darker green, then it's an indicator for high uh, nutrient availability. And if it's less green or light green, then there needs some additional. And that's uh, measured here, directly analyzed on the computer. And the computer gives directions to the a uh, fertilizer spreader which reduces or increases on that specific plot the amount which is uh, provided for crops. Here is this uh, other uh, picture of such kind of machinery and uh, actually they, they are doing a good job and uh, I think they are, uh, uh, yeah, they are probably the te technology of the future. Here you see some other examples, only a selection of examples. There's much more. And the development um, uh, definitely goes towards uh, automatization. Driverless, driverless machines, uh, then uh, unmanned aerial vehicles, UAVs, will be, play a role and uh, manual labor and laborers will um, increasingly are taking processes that would bring us to a consequence which not is easy which is not easy to, to tackle later on. Examples here you see a drone uh, can be used for monitoring data for once since then little deer have their nests in fields they can detect where these are they are in front of the harvester the combine harvester and they detect such kind of spots. Even in wine production and in fruit production, wine, in Germany at least, is yeah, in parts done at very hilly regions and in small plots, in small uh, plots, and um, need a limited amount of pesticide or, or, or fungicide or, or whatever. So drones are used already there for spreading in these uh, hardly to uh, reach uh, regions. That's great. Harvest, this is fruit, harvest, uh, unmanned vehicle and uh, harvest machine. That's feed supply, also a robot uh, without any influence from human beings. And that's a milking robot, uh, which does milking uh, automatically without uh, any 
any farmer or person being around. Only a few examples, there are many, many more. Um, what's um, to my observation not yet decided, we have uh, also two general options or two general alternatives what um, unmanned vehicles uh, belongs. One would be the big tractor, which we know. We easily, technology is available, we can use them without a driver. Yeah? That's, uh, only legal restrictions are there, why we are not uh, allowed to do that. But the technology is ready to go. Also combined harvesters, it can be done unmanned. Uh, and some companies in Germany, and uh, I think John Deere is also on, 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 on that way, have a completely different system. Uh, going away from this big machinery, uh, using a uh, higher number of small machinery, like the robots we use in our gardens for mowing the low, um, they can be used. Um, they, have, um, they have advantages compared to the big, which could the advantages be? We were talking about it. Yes, the big tractor unmanned with the big equipment and the small farm on the other hand doesn't fit. You yeah. Take smaller ones and you won't need hundreds, you won't need only ten for your small scale farm. Yeah? That's one thing. Other comments? Maintenance. Maintenance is much easier. Yeah, if the big if the big has to be maintained, then you cannot work on the field. If one or two of these small are missing, doesn't matter. Process can go on. And soil, compactness, soil, compactness. soil compactness is a very, very big, big issue. Yeah, they are light. There's no soil compaction with those, so they have advantages. But there is no. They are both in about the same stage of development. And for me, it's very hard uh, to make um, a forecast which one will succeed. Maybe it will be a parallel uh, thing, it, it could be actually. Um, then let's move very quickly to livestock production, uh, not only crop production and as you can see, things are similar. The only thing which uh, differs is um, the detection of the location where you are. In um, livestock there is no GPS used. Uh, there is um, 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 Remote um, sensors are used in the stable. There are receivers and there are, uh, um, uh, yeah, like like uh, cell phone, uh, like what? Uh, wait a moment. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, um, uh, local area networks, uh, local area networks uh, can be used for animals, transmitters and. Uh, um, receivers, um, receivers at the transmitters at the cow and receivers at the feeding station or at the milking parlor or wherever. But everything same is 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 uh, everything else is the same in crop precision farming and livestock precision farming. In crop precision farming, we subdivide large fields. In uh, animal livestock production, we. Uh, um, subdivide a whole herd into single animals and we treat single animals according to their performance and their characteristics. Um, yeah, so that can be done with feed supply, with water, and uh, no, that's concentrate feed, that's roughage feed, that's water supply, can be done individual per animal. Uh, there's a weighing facility. So life weight can be measured, melting can be done uh, automatically uh, by melting robots. So about the whole process can be done automatically and the farmer is not needed anymore. Yeah, you laugh about this picture, but that picture has um, in the background and in a more abstract level um, a very crucial uh, information which uh, I don't have a solution uh, yet. Why? Uh, the content and the quality of labor done by farmers will change dramatically by digitalization. 
he used to do this one. And he used to do the milking, at least in the milking parlor, being, um, being with the cows and uh, observing that everything functions well and so on. That is not to be done anymore. But time is still there, so what he has to do? Or what should, we, what, what should he do? In the, she, he should collect the data and he should observe the data and she should analyze the data and he should draw conclusions out of the data and make decisions. And I ask you the question, who knows many farmers who are used to that kind of business? I, I, don't, I don't know hardly any. They are educated and they are uh, uh, learned their, their job to doing to doing that one and that one. Yeah, that was in the evening and in the weekend. But now it's the major part of his uh, labor, and there has to be found solutions actually. Yeah, the labor content or the quality of labor will change in many many fields dramatically by digital uh, advices. But this also might be more. You are right, perfectly right. That can be a positive effect of the urbanization movement. Uh, agriculture on a high technical level becomes much more attractive to young people than it was in earlier times. Agriculture in Germany has a bad image, yeah, a, re a real bad image uh, concerning uh, young people entering this. Uh, and young male farmers have a very hard time to find girlfriends and women. <laughs> no, it, it, it's, it's true. But that improves, actually. That, that improves, yeah? Because it's a high tech. We are working in a high tech sector, actually. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's a very important point. Uh, farming becomes by applying these technologies more and more attractive. Uh, development of business, very briefly, the final stage will be a real-time enterprise. A uh, farmer is running out of uh, nitrogen fertilizer on a certain field. He's using his smartphone, calling, um, uh, informing his uh, supplying company for fertilizer. Uh, uh, they know where he is at the moment and they have a truck in the surrounding of 12 kilometers or something and he gets direction to come and to bring uh, directly no storage, no nothing, uh, directly to the end user and that will be the future of this real-time development and that also will be made possible by digital devices. Uh, technology developments, uh, also this I made uh, briefly that's what software or IT systems have to guarantee. And for me, the most important part is this one, the most important issue. Never again manage data twice or collect data twice, which in earlier time was done. I had to enter my data to my plot record system. I had to enter it to my enterprise optimization system. I had to report it to a company. Uh, that should be over. Once the data is collected once, it can be used for 12 or 15, 20 purposes, but collection is done only one time. Yeah. That saves us a lot of mistakes, lot, uh, increases the quality tremendously, and saves us a lot of time if we do that. That must be the idea behind this development. Another important thing is, since farmers don't like, sit at the desk and to do some paperwork. We have to get them where they are. They are on the machinery, on the tractors, and we can reach them by mobile devices. devices. So every software developer or every uh, IT solution developer is well off is he, if he adjusts to farmers' habits uh, to provide to him uh, mobile services yeah, as uh, much as possible. Um, NutriWeb as an example, that's what I was calling before a regional cluster. If we have a region with 70-80% uh, of grassland, 
uh, for instance, we probably have dairy cows there and we probably have sheep and we have cattle there uh, to best use these feeding stuff. Um, and they need um, milk processing unit, a close pipe, the transportation uh, ways will be kept short. They need specialized veterinarians. They uh, need equipment uh, uh, advisors and they need uh, feed suppliers and they build regional clusters and that can be also done by computer networks or by integrated networks where uh, one takes over the responsibility. Data will not kept in each and single of the uh, participants but will be uh, kept uh, collectively by one provider and he's analyzing the data and um, supporting all the participants. So this is this um, outcome or one of the outcomes of this uh, comprehensive project we did. It was called IT Food Trace and it was a combination of research universities, research units, NGOs and IBM was one of our partners and I will explain what our idea was. We came from the idea if we want to organize or to um, observe or to uh, control a comprehensive uh, agro-food supply chain, uh, we have to have all the data from each level. From uh, enterprises of each level. That was the, the basic idea. Yeah. But after a while, when we realized that uh, there is completely different software used at each level. They are not compatible to each other. Data standards are, are not, not, not used uh, commonly over. So um, uh, retail, uh, food retail stores always wanted to put their systems to all other members of the, of the supply chain. Um, we ended up with the idea that that will be a complicated thing to uh, adjust them and to form one commonly used um, commonly used uh, uh, data standard and data system. So we developed another idea. Why, why taking the data? Because once you have the data and something happens, you are responsible as the data holder, yeah? not the company who makes the mistake. You have the data, you should, should have realized that something is going wrong. Yeah? And uh, nobody wants to do that. It's hard to find a company or NGO or uh, whomever who takes over this re responsibility. So the solution uh, we developed was not collecting the data, not centralizing the data, leaving the data at the uh, members of each, uh, of each level of the supply chain and only collect metadata. Yeah, a description of what kind of data is in Slaughterhouse 1 and a description of what kind of data is in Slaughterhouse 2. Yeah? Like the IDs of batches, not the single animals. Or uh, the, the, uh, just a description of the data. That's a limited amount of data and that can be managed centralized. We still have to find a fiduciary uh, uh, organization who has the trust from each and every member of the food supply chain but once we have this and we have something uh, happening or some malfunction uh, in the food supply chain by the metadata we very quickly can uh, identify uh, the um, company or the, the, the partner on a certain level of the food supply chain and I just uh, um, um, was um, I know I was evaluator in a call from our federal ministry of um, economics, economic affairs, dealing with uh, artificial intelligence in different branches, and I had the chance uh, to read or to learn about 20 of these applications, and in three or four. I have seen that this idea becomes realized actually. It's used and it will be in future uh, Im implemented in practical, in practical things. Question? Yeah. Uh, 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 ah. From the kind of data that you're able to make any management decisions, you? the metadata, 
Yeah. From the meta yeah. You make, make what kind of decisions? Are you? Uh, it's traceability. It's it's finding as quick as possible the origin of a certain malfunction. Yeah, something happened in slaughterhouse too. Some hygienic problems. Yeah, but still the process is going on. And food retailers at the end, they realize that something is wrong. So what I have is a batch number or, uh, and I have the meta information where this uh, batch number belongs to. Then my um, centralized service immediately can um, find out the slaughterhouse in which this uh, thing happened and report to them to stop the process and to identify which batches are are uh, rotten or are uh, not in good quality and take them out. Yeah. Otherwise, if you have to inform all retailers or all uh, restaurants to uh, go back and to look at their, uh, that would take much, much, much more time. Uh, mobile. Device, devices means we need apps, and uh, here's an a, a incomplete selection of what uh, apps for farmers uh, are developed. Meanwhile, um, if we screen the whole range of apps, and you can do that as well in, in your countries, you will find that the more sensitive, the more time sensitive data are, and the more flexible data are, like prices for products and for materials, um, weather forecasts, <coughs> regional weather forecasts, uh, uh, the more time sensitive they are, the more they are used by uh, apps and by digital uh, mobile uh, devices. Yeah? Other things like the strategy of the European Union, common agricultural policy, you don't need an app. You read, that, you read that somewhere else uh, that is not time, time sensitive. Uh, yes, environmental uh, issues also influence and will ask for more monitoring in the future, but I will uh, skip this actually. Uh, there are developed um, so-called sustainability assessment tools, software-based, uh, can be applied for farms or for uh, supply uh, chains, collecting data from all three pillars of sustainability, ecological, social and economic pillar, and as an outcome you get such a spider diagram which uh, indicates uh, these are the ecological parameters or indicators, the social ones, the economic ones, and you can see this single farm has weaknesses in the economic part is well off in the ecological and in the social part in this diagram. That also needs a lot of data from farms which should be available, then things are easier instead of collecting them by surveys and by questionnaires or something else. Social aspects, I think I can skip everybody of you is well, well, well informed and well off that more and more and more and more information, not only for private purposes, but also for business purposes, are communicated on that way. And if you miss uh, this uh, channel in your marketing strategy, in 10, 15 years from now, you will not have any customers anymore, yeah? because they just did receive your information and your message, so we have to adjust here. This I can skip you know, much better than I do. Uh, two slides maybe uh, to the consequences which we can expect. Um, I'm pretty sure that you agree that there is a lot of potential of pro productivity increase, particularly labor productivity increase by mechanization in general, but by digitalization and automatization in particular. There is a uh, lot. 
Uh, work content and work quality will change and uh, so far I don't see farmers not in the position to to make, take really advantage uh, of this uh, free time they have and to use it in an economic sense uh, for uh, improving the business. Um, relaxation of working hours, that's a very positive thing. If you were uh, 20 years from now, you were a dairy farmer uh, and a family farm, in a family farm. How many days per year you have been working? It's easy. 364 and sometimes 65. Um, yeah, because the milking has to be done <laughs> each and every day, twice or three times, morning, evening, sometimes at noon time. Um, again, and if you are a family farm, you have no higher labor workers uh, who can replace you. So uh, that, that is to be done. Milking robots uh, do that uh, automatically and release you from the production process. So you can give, go for a vacation, you can take a week, weekend off or something. This is from a social point of view. Also attracts more young people to go into farming again, yeah? Because they want to have a vacation. <laughs> Elderly as well. <laughs> um, risk changes, uh, uh, generally risk increases. Because uh, the more you depend on technology, the more uh, you are, um, you are, yeah, you have, um, uh, well, the, the higher is the chance that, uh, or you higher, you, you more intense depend on specialized service persons to do the repair, uh, the maintenance of, of this machinery. Um, you by yourself will not be able anymore in future to do that kind of stuff, but they have 24 hours services like making parlors. You can afford to have them uh, uh, two hours maybe out of order, but longer is no good anymore. And if you don't have a second unit or a third unit, you need emergency um, assistance, but they come on a 24 hours uh, basis. A growth potential, if labor is set free, we have also can use this labor for increase our farm, our business, yeah, going into new branches or doing some cheese production by ourselves, going deeper into production, into value creating uh, or uh, cooperating or uh, yeah, many other developments uh, you can um, do in growing your farm. And uh, we have improved quality of data and information. And as I said before, the motto has to be uh, collect uh, each and every data only once and then use it as often as you need and as it is uh, possible. That changes uh, the requirements and requests we have <coughs> for farmer sk skills. They should have and they have to train somehow information and communication capabilities. They should be curious and creative because they are, as I said before, there are disruptive technology changes. Uh, uh, that has, uh, 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 you have to be curious to, 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 to try it. They have to have motivational skills because they are more now in the management and leading uh, part of the farm and have to give advices to their co-workers organizational skills, leadership and social skills, uh, willingness to take risks, even, even uh, sometimes being the early adopter uh, of uh, technology and maybe have the pioneer uh, uh, premium uh, from, from applying it, and strategic thinking should be of more importance than it was uh, before. So to summarize and to conclude, um, I think you agree with me that uh, the challenges for agriculture grow in future and they are serious and there has to be sophisticated solutions to uh, solve them. Uh, any optimization potential must be exploited. Uh, ICT is uh, increasingly implemented or part of these uh, technological uh, 
development, economic and market factors, environmental and social aspects can be identified as the driving forces to penetrate the industry and connect it with this development. Business requirements are growing and opening up open spaces. That was it from my side. Uh, if time allows, we can afterwards have some questions or even you can approach me directly if you want. I thank you very much for your attention and for uh, contributions and questions you asked. It was nice to discussing with you. Thanks.